Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to European Rosales Rome. I'm your lovely host, Galvin, and it's time for yet another tutorial. I'm your lovely host, Galvin. I think I said that already. I don't know. So we're going to advance the start just, just a little bit. Wait. Uh, there we go. All right. Here we are, we will be playing as Rome at a non-standard start date, because today, we are going to talk about provinces. Mmm, yes, delicious provinces. The very lifeblood of this game. Hmm. So, here we have Rome, your typical province. Now, each province has varying attributes. We're going to start with these three. <clears throat> these three are your types of citizens. Well, Types of population. Let's go with that because confusingly the first one is called citizens The second one is called freemen and the third one is called slaves each type of population Gives you something slaves give you money through taxation freemen give you manpower to fight your battles with and citizens give you research points to research things with <laughs> uh, All right now in addition to this, all provinces produce a trade good. In this case, Rome's is wine. You can also set up trade routes. Depending on what is constructed in a province, some provinces may have access to more trade routes than others. Next up, fort level, which is simply a value between 1 and 4 that shows how hard the province is to siege. Nothing too complicated there. And finally, Civilization. Single-handedly one of the most important things in the game. Civilization is tied to your ability to colonize. And although it also provides some other benefits, such as supply limit and research points, research points being incredibly useful, there's also a chance of barbarian rising, which is nice. Alright. So, typical Roman province. Now, <clears throat> as we look around here, there are also other things that we have to look at. Culture and religion. Simple stuff. You know. Etruscan. Roman. Roman. And so on. But in addition to this, we also have to look at the province that belongs to a region. In this case, we have two regions. Magna Gracia and Italia. Now. Magna Gracia and Italia are separate regions, and that means they are governed by separate people. As you'll notice when you click on different provinces, there are different faces. Now, your capital province is always ruled by your consul, king, or just general ruler. So, since my capital is with Italia, it will always be that. Otherwise, each province has a governor. Mm. And a governor you can appoint, generally. Uh, you cannot, for the first two years of a governor's rulership, however, unappoint him. He has to be uh, the governor for at least two years after you appoint him. <laughs> now, that's pretty simple, all so far. Now, the other thing we have to look at trade routes, is, or rather, trade goods and trade routes, is production. As you can see in Rome, we can produce velites but nothing else. In Etruria, did I say that right? Etruria? I don't know. You can also produce principa, principes, which are heavy infantry. Each culture has a different name for uh, military units, but the easy way is that you can always at any point in time just mess over this and it will say militia, or heavy infantry, or cavalry, or what have you, whatever you're messing over. Now, and that means we need to try and get heavy infantry in our capital. So I'm going to start training iron for wine. And this is rather quite important. Because iron is what allows you to have access to uh, heavy infantry. So now that I've given one month for the trade route to run its course and actually start working, I can go into Rome and build Principes. Fairly simple. Alright. And, of course, there are other resources that do similar things. So, look at the trade map mode. We, of course, have horses here, which allow cavalry and horse archers. 
In addition, there are um, also these elephants, which allow you to build war elephants. However, they are exceedingly rare and not fa actually found on the Mediterranean, as you may notice. They're here, here, and here. I also believe somewhere here? Yeah, here. War elephants are extremely powerful. The most powerful unit, in fact. However, they are also, single-handedly, the most expensive. Alright, now let's look at some other attributes of the province. These are the buildings constructed. As technology progresses, you will be able to build more buildings. Rome starts out with a lot of buildings that you actually can't build for quite some time, though. As odd as that is. And, uh, we also have barbarian power. This isn't particularly relevant to any province that you own uh, fully, but that's okay. In addition, we have Revolt Risk. You can simply hover over it. Your, my ruler is unpopular. And we have one stability and wine, so overall everything's okay. The maximum attrition, this is in percentage. Supply limit, that's how many troops can move through a province. Manpower, that's how many troops a province supplies each year. And growth. Alright. So we're going to head up to Bononia, or in Gallia Sicilpinia. Sicil sure, let's go with that. I fucking hate Latin. I can read and write in Latin pretty good, but heaven forbid I ever try and speak the damn language. Now, I've moved my army here. This province has a barbarian power of six. As you'll notice, it's actually the only one in there. And it's relatively important for uncolonized provinces. Because... In order to colonize, you need three things. The first thing is a province with at least 50% civilization. And this is where civilization becomes incredibly important. If you want to be able to continue colonizing, you need to be able to very quickly get civilization out to your farther reaches. Now, civilization, one of the ways to increase its spread rate is simply to have a higher civilization in an adjacent province. So, you know, this is 90%. This is 60%, so it's 0 0.3. Now, let's find something at a little different. 70%. 0.03. Damn it! <laughs> uh, I need something that's a little, uh, little bit more different to show. 10% isn't quite enough. Although there is a difference, it's just not quite enough to uh, be seen that way. Now, I'm just hoping these guys march back and forth, because I'm just simply sitting here trying to piss off barbarians. And uh, I'll go into this. <clears throat> the third thing, or rather I should go to the second thing that you need, is at least 10 people in, an, in said province that you have the level of civilization. Now, people do generate over time, and that can actually make a good omen, the blessing of Cupid. Unsurprising. Negative population growth, by a lot, no less. Hey, there we go. Uh, barbarian uprisings have a chance of occurring every month and every time you enter the province. So in order to attempt to speed it up, I often just walk between two provinces. Now, we have more than 10 people. We have a civilization value over 50. And actually both of these provinces. So it is a valid colonization. Ah, right, good. All right, so we defeated the barbarians. You'll notice that this has reduced the barbarian power to one, which is the third thing that you need. I believe you cannot colonize a province with a barbarian power of three or more. It has to be one or two. Now, barbarians defeated, Gaius Fabricus Lucinus has defeated the barbarians of Menope. Good. So, in addition, you've captured 0.6 slaves. This is how you, the other way in which you gain population, and in fact, the most effective way. By defeating barbarians' deck. And I don't mean simply just defeating them in combat, I mean destroying them, reducing them to zero troops. Barbarians will continue to exist until reduced to zero troops. This means that they'll often bounce back and forth, and can actually mean that people can kill steal you to get these slaves. Don't let that happen. Now, by capturing these slaves, that gives us 0.6 slaves to our empire. It's not particularly much, but it's something. Half of which go to the capital. The remaining 0.3 are then split across the remaining provinces evenly. Now, I'm pretty major on trying to capture slaves. I think it's incredibly important to do so. And I'm sure some people will disagree with me on the importance, 
but I will often send, if I'm not at war crushing somebody, teams out across the provinces of Germania. As you can see, they have seven out here. Uh, these numbers increase over time. You can easily start getting barbarians well into the dozens. Um, you can wait for them to come to you, because there is what's called a horde chance. Now, when a barbarian power is high, and the civilization in a province is low, you get what's called a horde chance. Horde chance is just a natural uprising. And here's the kicker. A horde that, say, starts out here is probably single-handedly the most dangerous. Because every time an army passes through a province, it has a chance of creating a barbarian uprising. Now, even if this army is a barbarian army, so let's say an army decides here that they want to come down and, and, and try and sack Rome, they will start passing through this many provinces to do so. And every time they walk through this, they have a chance of gaining more barbarians that will follow them. Because, you know, they'll come up here, and then they'll just uh, also want to try and sack Rome. That can make them extremely dangerous, and you have to be careful about that. You, On a bad day, you can just have a barbarian group of 40 come down, smash you, kick you in the face, loot, and destroy everything you own, and there's nothing you can do about it. Yep, the Germans are a cruel, cruel mistress. Be careful with them. So that's also the other uh, purpose that these teams that I send out serve. By keeping barbarian power in check, you can also protect yourself. It's not exactly feasible to do as a smaller country. At least, you know, not as in such a way that you could cover the whole of Germania and uh, Hispania, but nevertheless. Now, we finally finished our colony here. Colonies differ from provinces in one particular way. One, they have barbarian power. Yeah. So, they still have barbarian power. And this is sort of a problem. Um, barbarian power has to be reduced to zero to create it as a full province. It also knows it's Celtic and Druidic. Upon having it reduced to zero barbarian power, it will become a full province, and its culture and religion will change. Now, your first question, of course, is how do you reduce it to zero barbarian power? There's, it's technically random, but it's highly weighted. In particular, it's weighted towards three things. Your ruler's finesse stat, the governor's finesse stat, and the civilization level of the province. And we'll make the events that reduce barbarian power more frequent. Now, I also have to uh, appoint a ruler for the province. I could sit here and do nothing, and actually the Senate will uh, put forward a candidate. Probably in about a month. Roughly. They like to do that. But now, the other thing I need to do is trade with Rome. Grain for wine. Very important for two reasons. One, Rome's immense civic factions in power. Yay! One, grain is probably one of the most immensely important resources, as, you know, it provides growth. I've talked about this before. Growth is your research points, your cash flow, your manpower. It is everything. It is extremely important that you acquire them. So uh, be careful when invoking certain omens. They can be extremely devastating and hurtful, even if they only last for a year or two. So, since the Senate seems reluctant to uh, appoint somebody, hmm... Well, yeah, so I suppose we'll do it the Roman way. We shall place a proconsul, which means a former council. A former ruler to go govern this province. Now, you have to kind of be picky about who you uh, send out to govern in provinces, because governors might just decide that they want to be independent, in particular if their loyalty is low. And they might choose uh, to attempt a civil war and revolt against you, as well as taking any soldiers that were trained in those provinces with them. Now, this is one of the reasons why I generally train all troops out of my capital. Uh, my capital, I will always have a supply of iron flowing to, or at least a region in my capital will do. Any of them, I suppose, really. As long as it would be within Italia, in this case. This means that any uh, traitorsome governors who decide that they want to declare independence will not acquire the army. And it also makes them far less likely to try. 
So, in addition to this, we're also going to try and get Nigeria. Epirus accepted peace. Really? Holy fuck. I've made a terrible mistake, apparently. Now, you all have to keep an eye on your provinces. One, you just saw me get a uh, modifier called Barbarian Threat in a Border Province. If you do not garrison uh, your border provinces, and colonies specifically, with enough soldiers, you will get that, which increases your stability modifier. It's not particularly problematic. But it's something you should be aware of and cautious about. There we are. Uh, it is also the catalyst for certain events uh, that may cause barbarian uprisings in adjacent provinces, just so they can come burn your shit. So be careful about that. <laughs> now, things are going okay. Glad to see it. But mm, damn barbarians are not cooperating. It can take some time to uh, get a hold of them. Hey, well, it wasn't exactly the problems I wanted, but it'll be. Hey. Now, I didn't defeat the barbarians wholly and totally here. Which is okay. It's just basically going to be a uh, game of following them around. Until they're all dead. Very good. And the barbarians now rise in Nigeria, of which we just instantly killed. For another 0.7 slaves to be distributed throughout the empire. Now, this is an interesting error. It will simply say not allowed to colonize here, but it never mentions why. You cannot colonize if there is a foreign army in a province, which you can actually use to cock block. So long as I were to put troops in Nigeria, you know, Messalia can never colonize it there. Which is great. And so on. There we are. Defeated them for another 0.5 uh, troops. Very good. Things are going well. I'm very pleased. I want to build a career. So that he should get a job. Hmm. The Senate will often put forward many events like this. Eh, very well. Well, you have to agree with them or gain populists. It's a bit annoying, but what can you do about it? There we are. And congratulations, we have a new colony. We are growing steadily, although unfortunately Epirus was annexed by Carthage. And that is the basics of provinces. You have to go through and trade. The other thing to note about trade, by the way, is that it generates income. So if we have a look here at our economy tab... We are now getting 0 0.09 income from trade. It may not seem like much, but remember, I actually have quite a fair bit of trade routes I could theoretically do right now. So let's just start doing them. And this is only internal trade, which uses up, you know, two trade routes for, uh, which uses up two trade route slots, but only provides us one trade route's worth of income. So, kind of a problem. So, if I were... Let's assume that I was doing entirely uh, foreign trade. We could just double the amount I was making, roughly. And Senate is just like, appoint this incompetent person to this position, as they usually are. Damned Senate. Alright. <clears throat> so now we have the trade routes active. You can make roughly 0.6 from what I have right now. Which isn't too bad, overall. I think it's okay. If you uh, were to do certain things with ideas, in particular, there's uh, some ones that increase trade income. There's also national tax modifier, which I think is a bit better. Uh, then it's okay. But the other thing to remember is that Rome is actually incredibly populous. For smaller states that may not have as many people, especially tribes, like look at that, the point for or whatever that they get is massive. If you are small, the trade income actually matters a lot more if you're very thinly populated. Whereas for a much more heavily populated country, I am uh, far more comfortable simply relying on taxation. It also depends again on how many slaves you have as slaves provide money. You will have to balance that, 
how many slaves do I want? How many freemen do I want? And how many citizens do I want? Remember to keep your needs in mind and be constantly ever vigilant and ready to balance. If change needs to be made, then it needs to be made. Don't hesitate about it. If you're falling behind in something, or if you don't have, if, you know, well, let me try that again. If you're falling behind in technology, or if you simply don't have enough manpower or money, adjust your policies accordingly. You be it through revoking laws in the Senate, or moving and or adding national ideas, citizenship, such as citizenship and emancipation. And apparently, my tongue is just starting to fail me, so I'm going to call it an episode. Thank you everybody for watching this tutorial. I've been your lovely host, Kelvin, signing off.